train this network and they say, okay, I'm just going to throw away the final logistic regression model. I'm just going to like take a bunch of these outputs, maybe this guy, maybe this guy, maybe even these guys, and take treat all those as features and then train an SVM. Sometimes that works better. And then to answer the other question, sometimes you want to, you want to use this data set, uh, you want to use this network to be applied to a, net, to a different image classification task, maybe uh, something other type of other types of images, like maybe uh, animal images, for example. Pietro Perona's lab did a lot of work on this for bird classification. Um, and so the reason why you want, might want to do this is because if you look at this, right, these filters are a super general purpose, right? They could be applied to anything, right? There's not, it's not actually specific to ImageNet, the types of images in ImageNet. These are also pretty general purpose as well, right? So are these, uh, so, long as, uh, so long as you have these types of corners. At layer five, it might be a little you know, specific to the images you see in ImageNet, but certainly if you just sort of use, you want to use the first few layers, uh, repurpose them for some other classification test, you don't have to retrain the whole thing from scratch. Training the whole thing from scratch takes a long time. Just throwing away maybe the top few layers and retraining the top few layers takes orders of magnitude less computation than training the whole network from scratch. And people do this all the time nowadays. They repurpose these networks for other image classification tests. Uh, obviously some failure cases. This is an area, actually an area of active study in deep learning. So um, this image, the network predicts correctly. <coughs> this image, the network predicted incorrectly. Can anyone see the difference? Most of us think it's the same image, but somehow these image, these image intensities fold the network. And you know you can and you know if you dig into the network you can under, you can sort of start to see understand why because the network the network picks up on certain things that are statistically relevant to the classification task and there might be some edges that you can't see but edges that the network can see buried in here that tricks it to get some other object. What's the meaning of the middle column? This is the difference between this guy and this guy. So like, for example, I might predict this is a bus, school bus, and now I predict that this is a cow, right, something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because these convolutional layers, they're, they're compressions of the image, right? They, you learn, like, first layer, you learn 96 things. Second layer, you learn 256 things. So it's necessarily a, a compression of everything that, that identifies you as a bus, that identifies an image as a bus. So for example, if it, if, it, if it thinks it's a bus because of certain edges that dis distinguishes from other objects in the, in the data set, you can just delete those edges very subtly by adding this special adversarial noise to the image that you can't tell. But that's what the, that's what the neural network uses to make this classification. Okay, I'm a, okay, go. Uh, so this shows definitely overfitting. This is overfitting, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, do people like see it like, oh yeah, we just lucky that these particular images have characteristics that do not appear in nature, or could it So it turns happen? out that if you use the wrong kind of JPEG, JPEG compression, you could get something that's wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's actually real. It's long yeah, long. yeah, yeah, actually it's real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like if you want to do video, right? In video, in like MPEG compression, they, they do a lot of compression because of temporal coherence, right? And uh, the network can make mistakes if it tries to do learning on video. Yeah. So these issues are real. Maybe this is a bit adversarial, but these issues in general are real. Yeah. Artifacts can be introduced in various forms. Did you make it robust? Did you say, like, it's an area of active study, making it robust to stuff like this. Yeah. And my student, Stefan, actually works on this. Uh, question? So were these from the training set or validation set? Uh, I think these are from the validation set. I think. So I'm going to have to move on. Um, uh, in the remaining 10 minutes, I'm going to cover two other topics very, very quickly. Um, so training data models are extremely challenging because it's non complex, high capacity, easy to overfit. Um, so, how do we do this? Uh, these days, the only thing that's really changed, so these deep networks have been around for a long time, conceptually. The only thing that's really changed is like, the, the, uh, the amount of annotated data for supervised learning. Increase the computation trouble, uh, power and a better bag of tricks during optimization. Um, here's a bunch of tricks. Here's a bunch of so basically uh, here's a bunch of tricks. 
training it nodes is just the cat screen to set plus tricks. Uh, so the choice of regular linear over sigmoid, local contact normalization, uh, mini, uh, uh, mini batching instead of creating uh, stochastic gradient descent using momentum and adaptive learning rates, a bunch of tricks. Uh, I invited uh, one of the experts in deep learning to write a blog post on my blog. So if you're interested in all these details, you can check this out. Um, so rectal linear. So, rect so this is the sigmoid transfer function, right? This is the nonlinear transfer function at the output of each uh, So the reason why sigmoid is bad, even though this was sort of very popular for a long time, is because of the vanishing gradient problem. So this term, which is the which is the caused by this guy right here, or one of these guys. Cause, as you compound this over many layers, it gets multiplied together, and this thing is always between zero and one, and it causes the gradient to just vanish multiplicatively as you apply chain rule further down the network. So training slows down by a lot. Right. On the other hand, if you replace this transfer function from a sigmoid to a vector linear function, which is just this, right? Now this part, you know, at least in the activation area, it's just, it's linear, so it has no impact on the norm of the gradient. So now the gradient propagates by a chain rule down the network without losing its magnitude. So this is one actually, believe it or not, this is one of the biggest innovations in training deep networks in recent years because when you have like five, six, seven layers, the vanishing gradient problem using sigmoid is a very big problem. Gradient clamping, regular linear functions can grow unbounded, so the gradients can get very large. Um, one sort of simple thing that you can do is <coughs> you can just clamp the gradients. So if the gradient has norm greater than 15. Divide it, multi divide it so that it norm is no more than 15. Yeah, don't ask any questions, but it's just works. Um, okay. Um, you don't actually have to train dense convolutional networks. So, for example, here every com every uh, every layer from this every layer here every neuron in this layer takes as input every every neuron in this layer. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have if the neuron be a 10 channel convolution, you could have it instead of be 5, right? You could split it. And this can speed up training because now there's fewer parameters to learn. And furthermore, you can split it across two machines, right? You can now parallelize this. Uh, learning rate and momentum. So stochastic rate descent looks like this, right? So imagine that we can just uh, keep a moving average of the gradient update, gradient direction of the last however many. Um, however many uh, time steps, then we can also add a momentum term right, to keep moving in the direction that we've been moving along. This speeds up gradient descent a lot too. In certain cases of convex optimization, you could provably show that this uh, provably speeds up gradient descent. Well, of course, we're dealing with a non-convex version. Uh, the step size, uh, basically, um, you know, because this is non-convex, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful with the step size. And so the typical trick is as validation performance plateaus or gets worse, you just exponentially decay the step size, right? Drop out, drop out, it randomly turns off nodes during training. So if this is my network, right, the hidden, this is a raw input, hidden layer, hidden layer output, then during training, I'm gonna randomly not look at some of the layers, some of the hidden neurons, randomly. So this is actually used for regularization. It makes the network more robust. And there is a theoretical analysis, some theoretical analysis, that explain why this is a form of regularization. Uh, the intuition is that it decorrelates the nodes in each layer. At a super high level, similar to the intuition for random forests, but the details are very, very different. Okay, so a brief overview of one of the networks in four minutes. So, um, unsupervised deep learning, so this is sort of, like, I view this as sort of the next frontier in deep learning. Right? Rather than using supervised labels, just um, unsupervised learning. Right. Unsupervised learning, we've seen a few instances of in this lecture, mostly as a way of encoding data, like PCA, right? We encode data, the raw data, just the X, using a low-dimensional representation that we can reconstruct with minimal loss, right? PCA is a linear encoding with a linear decoding of just multiplying by the basis vectors, eigenvectors. You know, unsupervised deep learning does something very similar, but it does so in a non-linear way. Said. Uh, we could do generative deep learning. So uh, this is often done in the unsupervised setting where we want to build not just an encoding, like a PCA style encoding, but a probabilistic encoding right, of, the, of images. So maybe from this, we can actually sample new images. right? 
if we train on an unsupervised, large unsupervised training set of images, like if we downloaded a billion images from Flickr, can we learn a probabilistic model how to generate images from Flickr by understanding statistical regularities and like convolutional invariant translation invariances and stuff like that that are sort of represented in the uh, in let's say a billion Flickr images. Recurrent networks uh, have become very popular recently as well. So they're networks that model sequences, right? Thus far, these deep convolutional networks and deep networks, they predict multi-class classification, like 10 classes, 1,000 classes. Uh, one could also do sequence prediction, so you know, it's something that CRFs you know, can do as well. And basically, the idea of recurrent neural networks is you have a sequence of X, and this is, again, supervised again, typically. And you have a sequence of Ys, and you want to predict, given X, you want to predict Y. But you only look at a subsequence of X at a time to predict one token in Y, and then you have these hidden layers, right? And then the, the hidden layers get transferred to the next hidden layer. So the, the, in, the input to this hidden layer is the output of the previous hidden layer, which takes its input, uh, the, the raw inputs, and it, also the output of the current hidden layer for, on the previous token. So it can model sort of dynamics of input sequences to some extent. So this is called a recurrent neural network. There's also recursive neural networks, which says, I want to define this neural network recursively. If there's a tree, if there's a tree decomposition of a neural, of a of, a, of a problem instance, then I want to apply this neural network recursive that takes as input recursively the output of its of, it, of itself applied to its children. Right. So it's the same network. So it's, there's, each of these has many hidden layers and it has an output, and the output is applied to itself again, um, so on and so forth. So one, way, one thing, one application of this is sentiment classification, sentiment analysis. So you have a sentence, you compute the parse tree of the sentence, you apply a recursive neural network on the parse tree of the sentence, and you can predict like sentiment. So this, this is a way of modeling things like not, right? If you say something like this is not good, right? Then by, the, by, by applying something like a recursive neural network, you can know that the not is negating the good, therefore this is a negative sentiment sentence. Whereas if you use a bag of words model, it's like one negative word plus one positive word is a positive or negative sentence, I don't know. Okay, so just to recap, sorry that was a little fast at the end. Um, deep learning uh, is basically a method of learning hierarchies or layers of nonlinear transforms for the raw inputs. You can interpret this as feature learning. Some connections, sometimes you can visualize this, some connections to uh, biology, biologically inspired methods and, and observations. Most of the stuff that we talked about today is supervised learning, where you require supervised labels at the top. Right? Unsupervised methods are also possible, but just thus far, far less successful. And you train using stochastic gradient step plus change rule plus lots of tricks. Right. Um, so that's it. If you want more resources, here's a bunch of here's a list. And next week we'll be looking at recent applications, survey advanced topics, and today is a recitation of advanced optimization.